Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah and I am the Education Assistant for Dunlop Art Gallery, a part of Regina Public Library. Tonight I'm pleased to welcome you to the Quick and Dirty Artist Talks, Bodies. Tonight we have invited four artists who work with themes of body and identity within their work to discuss their inspirations and practices with us. Please note that there will be some blood and nudity in tonight's talk, so viewer discretion is, is advised. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Regina Public Library and the lands on which we're virtually gathering today are that of Treaty 4 territory, the traditional territories of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota, and the homeland of the Métis. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge this the support of uh, Dunlop Art Gallery's key funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, and Saskatchewan Lotteries. We invite all of our viewers to ask questions for the artists throughout the program this evening, and we will be taking time after each artist for a quick Q&A period. So please do post your comments in the comments section. <coughs> all right, so we are going to introduce Elizabeth here, and we're gonna say goodbye to everyone else for a moment. Welcome, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth Elick is a printmaker who combines fibers and menstrual blood into her work as a way of examining experiences of menstruation. Originally from Saskatchewan, Canada, Elizabeth received her degree in visual arts at the University of Regina and is currently at Indiana University, Bloomington, Indiana, uh, working towards her MFA. Before moving to Indiana, uh, Elizabeth had the privilege of teaching printmaking workshops throughout Saskatchewan, sessional teaching at the U of R, and artist residency at the George Bothwell Library in Regina, and working at the Dunlop Art Gallery. Her work has been shown in Canada, the US, and abroad. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sarah. And just a quick reminder to our viewers, please do add any questions that you have for Elizabeth in the chat during their presentation. All right, Elizabeth, I am going to hand things over to you. One moment here. Great, uh, thank you so much. Um, the influence of my work started about nine years ago in a variety of medical offices, these medical offices, as I dealt with um, endometriosis. I had never thought about my period before this, um, but I soon became aware of how many medical issues a uterus can have and how complex the medical institution is around the uterus. Uh, through conversations and my own research, I also became very aware of how heavy the silence is around menstruation and that it's not just me that never talked about it before. Uh, early art influences related to this are Judy Chicago and her representations of menstruation. Through her photolithograph, Red Flag, and then her installation, Menstruation Bathroom, these pieces were created in the early feminist art movement and didn't shy away from depicting menstruation and its visceral reality. But these pieces were created in the early 1970s and pad commercials have only started using red liquid to depict blood within about the last five years. So this uh, is a big motivator in my work. I use menstrual blood in my work through methods of printmaking and fiber substrates. Prior to this, I was using ink and beads to create blood patterns and represent men to represent menstruation. The start of the pandemic and the lockdown a year ago was what started my use of menstrual blood it was never convenient before to collect my blood or to bleed onto surfaces, but the pandemic really helped with that. Um, that being said, uh, my period has become really light as I've uh, gotten later into my 30s. So I've been really fortunate to have friends gift me with their used menstrual products and or straight up blood. Um, to help make my work. It's really, really nice and appreciated. Um, I use the pads that I receive or my own um, as a matrix and or a medium to create stains in my work. 
I have, I really enjoy working with this water soluble material. Um, it seems weird, but I just am continuously learning how it reacts to different surfaces, how quickly or slowly it oxidizes, the color that it changes when it oxidizes to, and then how it can create different effects as a medium. Uh, fabric textures play a big part in my work to create stains in uh, the variety of mediums. I really, oh, uh, sorry, play a big, uh, fabric textures play a big part in my work because it is a common variable amongst all menstruators. Anyone who menstruates is working towards a goal to keep blood off of the fabrics they interact with. And this is enforced through period products, product ads, and society in general. This unspoken framework informs on the negative and dismissive perspectives that persist around menstruation. In my work, there is an intentionality in creating blood stains and developing an aesthetic of period blood absorbing the printed fabric textures. I want my work to help normalize conversations around menstruation as viewers bring their own individual experiences to the work. Um, during grad school, I've been working towards figuring out the best way to depict menstruation, ranging from overt representations like the tampons or the sanguine mice, as I call them, uh, to more subtle uh, representations like the more formalized prints. Um, because of the intersectional reality of life, viewers have very different reactions to menstruation. Some are really drawn towards the more overt representations. Some are really drawn towards the more subtle um, representations. So menstruation as a visual, I'm really figuring out the best avenue to follow. And that's a, it's a constant negotiation. Um, the best way that I stay engaged with that negotiation is by engaging people in conversations about menstruation, which again, I'm not like trying, always sidling up to people and like, uh, so how's your period? But whenever, but given the space, people do love to talk or are open to talking about menstruation, um, their experiences, the stigma that is still very, very real. Um, and that is something that really motivates and helps to drive the direction of my work. One of my students who is like really young, a freshman, mentioned that one of their high school teachers had uh, get, made the comment when they asked to go to the washroom, can't you work around that? And that's, sometimes I get so entrenched in this, I feel like menstruation has, is normal. It's normal to me. But hearing stories like that from a student who's like probably 18, was born after two th the year 2000, um, much younger than me, uh, it is really good to hear those stories to get back to the root of um, the stigma and the taboo and why I'm doing this work. So a year from now, I will have my thesis show and I'm excited to be able to fill a large gallery space with um, menstrual blood and to be able to engage viewers with uh, this material and with this topic. Um, so thank you to the Dunlop Art Gallery for letting me talk about it here. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Oh, there we go. It's frozen. <laughs> um, so we do have one question here for you from Kathy, and I'll put it up on screen for us. Have you mixed menstrual blood with the UV transparent ink for silk screens such as we have at the U of R? Hi, Kathy. Um, I wasn't using menstrual blood when I was at the U of R, and um, but I have mixed menstrual blood with um, some water soluble inks, um, the Akua inks. And it's a very interesting uh, situation. It 
dr oxidizes and dries really, really quickly because you're like working it into the ink. And so it really changes very, very quickly. Um, I haven't done it with the UV silk screen just because at that time I wasn't doing it. Also, uh, it would be interesting to negotiate with the screens. Blood is not um, a perfect uniform uh, liquid. And so it would definitely be an interesting uh, experiment. That's for sure. I don't know how it would cure under the, uh, the lights either, but I really do like experimenting. So that is something to try. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, any more questions from our viewers? I'll give you all a moment um, to pop those in. And Vanessa has a question here. When dealing with your own and others' bodily fluids, do you have to present these works behind shields or disclose that they are potential biological hazards? I have never um, done that. I am very careful when I'm working in the studio to like make sure that I'm obviously cleaning up after ourselves, myself and uh, you know the pads that I'm using get disposed of properly. Um, and I've never been asked to like present things uh, behind glass or whatever. But I also kind of don't even broach that subject, partly because um, we give space to a lot of biological other materials like um, Kleenexes, used Kleenexes are given a lot more space. And I understand that uh, menstrual blood is different, but also it's not. So in my own, like everyone should accept menstrual blood finger wagging, I don't even broach that subject. So, um, but it's a good question. Great, thanks. And Sherry's actually got a question, so I'm gonna add them to our stream here. Hi, uh, I was just, I found it so compelling that you called tampons sanguine mice. And it's the kind of like thing that made me think there's probably a brilliant story behind how they started getting called that. And if you feel it would be appropriate to share, I was like, really? Like, I mean, maybe a little super curious. Totally. And actually my sister was also like mice, like what the heck? But this is something I heard um, like years ago that plumbers call tampons in pipes white mice. And so, and then the, the color that I'm using with the blood and and how it oxidizes, like I often refer to it as sanguine, um, the color sanguine. And so, but also sanguine is like cute and nice and happy and optimistic. And so um, that's, it is a colloquialism that like, I definitely uh, am careful to use because not everyone uses it, but I find it charming and, uh, <laughs> Kind of funny so <laughs> thank you i was really curious yeah thank no you. thank you all right and we actually have one more question here from margaret this may be a bit of a stretch but are you inspired by helen frankenthaler and her stain paintings um i do love uh helen's work um i haven't seen a lot of her paintings i've looked a lot more at her uh prints and so i will definitely look into that margaret you're always a wealth of knowledge and uh of art knowledge so thank you awesome. for that reference well thank you so much elizabeth we are going to move on to our next presenter for the evening and we'll come back to you at the end <laughs> and welcome Seamus. and i'm going to do a little introduction for you as well today so folks can learn a little bit more about you. Um, so Seamus Gallagher is a non-binary photo and virtual reality artist currently based in Chibuktuk, uh, which is Halifax, Nova Scotia. They recently graduated from NASCAD University with a double major in photography and expanded media in 2019. Their work has shown in festivals and exhibitions across Canada, as well as in Germany, England, Switzerland, and Los Angeles. They are the recipient of the 2017 AJ 
AGO AMA uh, Photography Scholarship, the 2018 NASCAD Student Awards, and the 2019 BMO First Art Awards. They were also recently long listed for the 2019 and 2021 Scotiabank ne New Generation Photography Awards. Welcome, Seamus. Hello. Thank you so much for and having me. Of course. And uh, just a quick reminder to our viewers again, please do add any questions that you have for Seamus um, during their presentation. All right, so I'm going to get this PowerPoint up for you and I'll let you take it away. Hello, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for everybody in attendance. Um, so the first few images are sort of early work that I did. I started working in self-portraiture around 2017, around my second year at NASCAD, and have uh, really continued in like various capacities to work in self-portraiture ever since. Um, my, uh, I was interested in this period of like experimenting with constructed spaces, body language, and text through these almost regressive uh, childlike environments, uh, almost like the television show Art Attack. Um, I was using like temporary tattoo stickers, uh, iron on fabric transfer paper and sort of this material to articulate these emotive responses to themes of like trauma and isolation. I started working through this project as I started to identify as non-binary and changing my pronouns. And I was interested in self-portraiture, but not so much uh, actually to document my own face, but finding ways of using my body and interacting or hiding within these sort of self-made spaces um, that were just for myself. And this sort of repetitive and monotonous task of creating these sort of small sets is something that I've carried through, I think, to this day in my practice. Um, but as I was making these images, I was also began working with digital media and experimenting with 3D modeling and video game engines, uh, sort of to find new ways of creating space. Uh, around this time, I also began experimenting with drag. And so I was really wanted to incorporate these sort of drag aesthetics into my own digital practice. So I developed this process of um, 3D modeling these 3D uh, drag masks and costumes, breastplates, wigs, and um, headpieces. And I would run them through this software that converts 3D models into paper templates um, that I could then like uh, print out, cut, score, hot glue together, and then construct physically. Um, and so uh, I was sort of interested in uh, my sort of interest as a kid in like video games and my interest in adults uh, with drag and how both of them sort of operate as this form of a uh, fantastical embodiment. Um, and like thinking through that thread of uh, sort of like creating spaces uh, or finding spaces to perform within as a kid uh, and then doing so as an artist, um, uh, as an adult. And so one, uh, one sort of video game that I always return to when I was developing my photo project called The Slippery Place, which I believe we'll be showing just after this image, uh, it was this uh, video game called RuneScape that I played as a kid. Uh, and something that I kept going back to when I was uh, creating this project, uh, I was revisiting this, um, this space in this game called RuneScape called the Makeover Mage. And it was an area where you could go to this Makeover Mage and the mage would um, change your gender for you through the video game. And so as like an 11 year old, I found myself just constantly going back to this makeover mage and constantly changing my gender and then going to like um, like flirt with strangers through this like chat room of this video game uh, and think about this like extremely problematic form of gender performance in like a digital space as like an 11, 12 year old. And um, uh, yeah, just having like this digital space to experiment with gender in this way uh, and like inviting those parallels through uh, this uh, photography series that I was working on. Um, it was called The Slippery Place, which uh, its name comes from the sort of etymology of the word glitch, which uh, refers to glitchin, uh, which means to slip or to slide and thinking about a glitch as this sort of slipperiness um, an area for like fluidity. Uh, I was really influenced by Legacy Russell's glitch feminism while I was working on it. And so as I started familiarizing myself with this process of mask making and costume making, I was also moving into video and virtual reality work and trying to work uh, in a more narrative form. So I was commissioned to create a work for an arts festival in PEI in 2019. Uh, and that is uh, a still that you're seeing right now. Uh, the video is called Thinking of You, Thinking of Me. And it features my sort of drag persona posing and performing in front of a set made out of large format 
prints of a hand holding these sort of fake plastic flowers. Um, that's in the foreground and in the background, there's these sort of theater curtains, which are actually just shower curtains with a stock image of a theater curtain printed onto it. So I was interested in like playing with this idea of like a copy of a copy. And I became really invested in the idea of cheap imitation uh, and its relation to like drag. Um, but I also found this essay about um, sort of imperfect mimicry within different species. And uh, I can, uh, and there were like certain organisms that would protect themselves from others through this imperfect mimicry of other species, uh, where they would do such an inconvincing job of mimicking another that this confusing appearance would keep itself safe. So uh, the video is all about sort of relating this idea of cheap imitation as a form of protection and also like adopting gender signifiers uh, of others for safety. But it also ended up being partly about um, desirability, particularly in terms of like queerness and uh, for like gender non-conforming individuals. Still really proud of the project. I don't know if it was like super well received by the PEI families that saw it, but um, nonetheless, I still am a very big fan. Um, so finally, the project I'm working on now uh, is like a work in progress. I've sort of spent the past few months thinking about uh, this idea of hauntology, uh, the idea that our present is haunted by lost futures of the past. And so I've been thinking about these lost futures in relation to the 1939 New York World Fair, uh, where it's themed that year was the world of tomorrow. Uh, I've been particularly fascinated with the DuPont Pavilion there as they were showing off their newest invention, nylon stockings. And their pavilion featured this unnamed woman whose only uh, identification was as Miss Chemistry. And she was perched atop this pedestal around fake plastic trees, um, showing off the nylon stockings. Um, and so my project now is sort of um, uh, through this larger body of work uh, and performing as the sort of ghost of mischemistry to uh, address themes of like eco crises caused by corporations like DuPont and um, the sort of um, inability uh, culturally currently to like envision a world of tomorrow outside of the framework of capitalism. Um, still work in progress. This is like a lenticular print that I've been working with. Um, where one side is this image and the other one was the previous image uh, that says all its changes loomed somewhere beyond the present. Sorry, I think I packed too much in there, but I am done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Seamus. Um, I'll let folks uh, take a moment to ask any questions in the comments section. Um, so we'll go back to that in a second. Um, some things that folks have said so far, we've got Margaret says, fantastical images indeed. Thank you so much. Um, and Hannah says, yes, I can totally uh, identify that as a role of drag. Great. Any questions from the audience? I'll give you one last chance here. And if you have some um, that you'd like to come back to at the end, you're welcome to add those throughout the talks as well. Okay, you got off easy tonight, Seamus. Amazing, it's pretty late <laughs> here in Halifax, so I'll take it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and we will see you back in a little bit here. All right. Thank you. And up next, we have Michelle Lacombe. Welcome, Michelle. I'm gonna do a little intro here for you today. Great, hi. All right. So since graduating from Concordia University in 2006, Michelle Lacombe from Montreal, Quebec, has developed a unique practice located at the intersection of performance, drawing, and body art. Her work, uh, which takes the form of either short duration uh, actions or research-based projects rooted in conceptual embodiment, is characterized by her use of simple gestures, mark making, and strategies of discomfort to complicate the reading of her body. Recipient of the 2015 Bourse Plan Sud, uh, her work has been shown in North America, Mexico, Argentina, and Europe in the context of performance events, exhibitions, and colloquiums. Uh, her artistic practice is paralleled by a commitment to supporting undisciplined and independent forms of art making. She is currently the director of Viva Art Action. Welcome, Michelle. Hello. All right, so I'm going to hand things over to you here.
So um, I'll repeat myself a bit in the introduction uh, and give an overview of my work. So located at the intersection of performance, drawing, and body art, like was said, my practice exists uh, to question the subjectivity of the white cisgendered female body, or specifically my body, as well as the visual histories and cultural constructions that surround its representations. Within the context of my work, I seek to complicate, trouble, honor, or disrupt the numerous feminine themes, characters, and tropes that relate to my body. So things such as the nude, the mermaid, the erotic dancer, the waitress, the witch, really whatever. Uh, in this way, I'm working through the various cultural and historical references that my body carries and evokes, regardless of whether or not I actually identify with them. Uh, as mentioned, my work generally takes one of two forms. The first is short duration performance art projects, which look like what you would expect performance art to traditionally look like. So a series of somewhat abstract gestures performed in front of a knowing audience. Uh, these use familiar actions and simple materials to create brief but poetic transformations. So for instance, my body will become a ghost, my belly will become the sea, or my t-shirt will become foam on a draft beer. Uh, this work makes up the most spontaneous side of my practice, so the actions themselves are always concise and super structured. The other form my work takes is long duration research based practices, um, research based projects rooted in conceptual embodiment or what I call a lived bodily experience. This is the part of my practice that today's presentation focuses on and to illustrate I've included images from five body art works that were executed over the past 10 years. Um, my body art projects always begin with a slow research period during which I outline the project's intentions, conceptual logic, and references. This can take months or years depending on the work. I'm a really slow artist actually and I don't produce a lot. <laughs> Um, eventually, this research leads into an action that takes shape in or on my body and transforms it. Because of my interest in drawing, or specifically the relationship between line, trace, and surface, these bodily experiences often involve corporal mark making using body modification techniques such as tattooing, scarification, and bloodlines, which are inkless tattoos that can heal or scar depending on how they're made. Um, so the presence of the artwork on and in my body is sometimes ephemeral and sometimes permanent, depending on the intentions of the project. While today's project focuses, or today's presentation focuses uh, on more visible interventions into my body, it's important for me to say that I also work with non-visible examples of body transformation and embodiment, such as learning a new skill or manipulating my hormone profile with over-the-counter medication. Um, so if I live these works, uh, how do I share them? The way in which these works encounter audiences really differs from project to project. Uh, in most cases, the actions are performed privately with collaborators uh, acting as witnesses. Wider publics, therefore, are often left to discover the work through the traces on my body or via secondary means of production that emerge directly from the action. For example, the Venus landscape, which was the first project we saw, uh, which was at the beginning of the slideshow, uh, circulates verbally. So this could be as an artist talk or more often small talk that occurs whenever someone asks about the lines tattooed on my body. In either context, I show the more visible lines while I talk about uh, the simultaneous reproduction and deconstruction of Giorgione's painting, The Sleeping Venus, which is the first painted nude in Western canon of art history. This discursive way of sharing art is a nod to infiltrating methods of circulation first experimented by artists such as Adrian Piper and Yoko Ono. Um, so there's like a historical um, sort of second wave feminist artist uh, link between some of the artists today. Uh, in addition to the traces that uh, may appear on my body, the body art actions sometimes also generate a substitute that can circulate, like a photographic portrait, uh, like we saw in Portrait of a Self Memorial or an anonymous aesthetic beheading. However, to resist that the photo uh, takes the place of the art on my body, the photo is never printed or exhibited. Instead, uh, in that case, the image circulates anonymously and as a reproduction, so as to be in solidarity with one of its references, the anonymous women who modeled for decorative busts. In some cases, uh, the initial body art action continues to unfold into a whole corpus of artworks. Of all the watery bodies I've only known my own, uh, which was a year long body art project that is best described as an unfertility ritual, generated over several years, uh, ephemeral self water drawings, a series of cutout photos of the moon, two performances, a limited series of decal tattoos and another body art action. Uh, it took me quite uh, a long time, four years actually, and many forms to understand my impulse and resolve what my body had experienced over that one year project. Because some of these works exist permanently, uh, my understanding of them sometimes also shifts, which offers the opportunity to revisit them. This was the case with italics underlining for emphasis, which is the project we're seeing right now. 
Uh, it was initially executed privately in 2010 and reactivated in 2015 as part of a group exhibition. The work, a line tattooed on the inside of my bottom lip, attempts to render my speech important by applying the textual device of underlining to my spoken word. As part of the project's reactivation, after having my lip tattooed, I tried to explain to the audience why, after five years of living with the line on my body, I wanted to rename the work. As documentation, uh, we see here in this slide, um, coincidentally, a transcription of that explanation was installed lip height at the site of the action, which we see um, in this slide. So while we're looking at images of my work, uh, predominantly through this form of vision, uh, it's important for me to emphasize that um, the artworks are not actually located within the traces or the images that result from the projects. Uh, for me, the artwork really lies in the bodily transform transformation itself. Uh, for example, my most recent project, which is this one, Mask, with por uh, mask Portrait with Cutout Eyes, um, this was documented, this was a body art action that was documented via headshot and circulated uh, as a headshot professionally, which seemed coherent for a work that's about affirming one's status as an artist while complicating traditions in feminine pictorial self-portraiture and emancipated self-representation. However, what's really important in this work uh, is the healing process, an absorption and erasure that symbolically reconstructs the face and removes the mask. So while the photo documents the lines, and we'll see the portrait coming up after this one, more importantly, it marks the moment this transformation back to myself began. So to conclude, I just want to say that my work is often done with professionals, almost always, and I'd like to thank my different collaborators uh, with whom I worked over the years. This includes tattoo artists, photographers, transcribers. The ones we've seen who collaborated on the works today are Emilie Rabi, Rémi Thériault, Hazel Galansky, Sarah Tremblay, uh, Dominique Bodquin, and Marie-Michelle Deschamps. Uh, and lastly, uh, Alex Tran took the final headshot, which for the first time I got to use today uh, for the talk. So thanks, that's it. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I'll open it up to the viewers. If you have any questions, please do post those. Um, or if you wanted to go back to any of the pieces to look at those, please do let us know. Um, we'll give you a moment here and then we will move forward. Um, Seamus, just so you know, I do see that there are some questions for you at the end there, just so a heads up. All right. Which do you think, Michelle, um, while we're waiting for more questions, um, which do you think was the most challenging piece for you to, um, you know, experience, um, you know, as tattooing, getting tattooed? What was the most um, challenging one, do you think? Um, well, if, uh, are you speaking on like a physical level or on a more sort of like uh, emotional or embodied level? Because um, I think there's two different kind of difficulties sure. that the work can encounter. Yeah. For sure. Um, Let's go with uh, the, the physical and then we'll go back to maybe the emotional after. Maybe there's a juxtaposition between the two or? Yeah, so the physical one, uh, the most difficult one is not actually in the slideshow, but the scarifications are definitely more challenging because uh, to maintain the mark making or to maintain the line, you need to intervene in the healing process. And so the mark making actually lasts um, a number of uh, days up to a week. Uh, and so it's a kind of laborious uh, physicality that isn't present in the more immediate mark making techniques like um, tattooing. Right. Wow. Wow. And which one do you feel was the most emotional for you to? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Of all the watery bodies, I've always I only know my own is um, yeah. It was it is a ritual around infer infertility or unfertility. Uh, around the refusal to reproduce. And I think it took me uh, a year to do the project or to do the ritual. Uh, but like I said, over four years, I think to finally um, articulate and understand what I was really trying to achieve through that. So I can speak about it now as an unfertility ritual, but at the time it was an impulse and it, yeah, it took me over four years to finally put words on it. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. We do have a couple of questions here. Um, so Margaret asks, um, how did you develop your practice? Uh, it's a good question. I think my practice really blossomed when I graduated from school, actually when I got out of the structure of university. Um, in that, it allowed me to work in a way that um, was less structured and less disciplined. And uh, at the time, I was seeking ways of circulating my work that um, didn't depend on artistic structures like museums or galleries or festivals. Uh, and that's where, for instance, with the Venus landscape, I started working with body modification because uh, when you have tattoos, whether you like it or not, people talk to you about it. 
And I decided to try to turn that encounter, which can often be negative and intrusive, into a way of sharing an art practice. And that just really opened up a whole sort of uh, enthusiasm around uh, working with my body as a site for art making and as the sort of pure, like the source material for, for the work uh, and how it allows it to circulate uh, independently in lots of different ways. Great, thanks. And we have another question here from Vanessa. You mentioned that you are a slower artist and don't produce a lot of works. Have you ever felt any pressure to pick up the pace or produce more? Or does this time create greater satisfaction in the outcome of the pieces? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I was quite insecure about my rhythm of working uh, when I first got out of school. Again, you know, school really uh, encourages a certain kind of productivity. Um, and I really struggled when I got outside of school for that. Uh, however, after a number of years, I felt that the works I were making just felt so much more uh, true to what I was trying to explore and um, sincere and just exciting for me that uh, I decided to just trust myself and just go at it. There's also a level of permanence in a lot of the projects that I think required me to be um, really certain about wanting to commit to them because oftentimes, again, it's something that I will carry for uh, my whole life. Um, so yeah, I think initially that was a very real challenge or very real insecurity. And luckily for me, I've built a community around me. And in the past 10 years, I've been able to just uh, learn to trust my own needs as an artist, which is not easy ever, um, but important. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. And we will come back to you uh, after the program. Awesome, thanks. And up next, last but not least, we've got Sherry Ozignault, welcome. Hi. And I would like to introduce you. So Sherry Ozignault is a visual artist, social activist, DIY enthusiast and occasional writer. They are Nihia and Re Red River Michif of the Charette and Belanger families with Soto and Assiniboine ancestry. Personal and political, their art practice is grounded in indigenous, queer and feminist worldviews. Seeking social and ecological responsibility and kinship, they explore intimacy and permeability uh, between human and non-human bodies. Their practice includes sculpture, community projects, performance, Indigenous tattoo revival, scenes, and more. They received their MFA from York University in 2017 and their BFA from the Alberta in, uh, University of the Arts in 2012. Recent exhibitions in Toronto include The Body as a Fever Dream, curated by Dallas Falili uh, at X-Space Toronto in 2020, Pillory for Toronto 2020, where the shoreline meets the water, curated by Sirius Marquis Wary at the Arquives uh, in Toronto 2020, as well as Off Center at the Dunlop Art Gallery here in Regina in 2019, Fix Your Hearts or Die at the Art Gallery of Alberta, Edmonton 2019. And they were a participant at the uh, 2019 Banff Center Indigenous Arts Residency Ghost Days and the 2017 cohort at the Intergenerational LGBT Artist Resident residency on Toronto Island. Wow. All right. Welcome, Sherry. And a reminder to our viewers again, please do post any questions that you have for Sherry during their presentation. So I'm going to pass things over for uh, over to you here, Sherry. Thank you. Um, okay, cool. I was like, I get slides, right? <laughs> uh, perfect. Uh, so Tansi, I've already been introduced. Um, unfortunately, I can't introduce myself in uh, any of my traditional languages, but I did want to say that I'm currently in the Chatham-Kent area of Ontario as an uninvited guest on the land of the Anishinaabeg Nation and the traditional um, land of the Three Fires Confederacy. I think it's really important for me to mention that because within my art is a huge focus on like how different bodies relate to each other um, and a lot of kind of honing into the detail of that, which is why I threw this little like needle with the beads on it piece there. Um, 
This is a piece that I started working with when I was at the Intergenerational LGBTQ Residency in 2017. And it's a piece called, um, or it's part of a series called Sovereign Bodies. And while I was there, there was a lot of wild mint growing on the island. And I started kind of incorporating things that were around me into the piece in the studio. Uh, the kind of primary detail of this piece is some beadwork that you can see in the slide there. And a lot of my work involves honing in really closely on what I'm working with and like showing sort of a tenderness or care that um, you can see I'm talking with my hands. It tends to be very visceral and involve a lot of touch. Uh, that piece also came from a point in time when I was starting to look at how like the presence of the body in my art practice ties into um, my own sexuality and kind of different ways of exploring that. So the ropes that hold that piece are actually um, like using shibari ties that people sometimes use in kink. Uh, this is another piece that's hanging. That one is not tied with a fetish tie, um, but that is uh, work from my Entangled Bodies series that is actually where a lot of this trajectory in my practice started. And I'm not going through things in a linear timeline here, but rather by the connections that really interest me. Um, so that's a detail of that work. And I started responding to this log actually that had been in my neighbor's driveway. I brought it into my art studio and I was really compelled by all of these like little tendrils um, of the roots. And I started working with hair. I used to shave my head all the time. Everybody asked if it was my hair. It's not my hair. Um, this is another example of like a really kind of honed in detailed piece. I tend to find the materials that I work with in the environment around me. Oftentimes there's something that's just going to be waste and I'm really compelled by that. Not necessarily a lot of the hair in these earlier works. I was getting it from the beauty supply store, but I do have a lot of hair that people have gifted me now. So that's not so much a thing anymore. Um, this compulsion to kind of touch and be present with other bodies is really important to me. And also the acts of care is a way of embodying a relationship that really is entangled with how I experience the world. Um, so kind of in this piece, you can see that I'm very like clutching and holding onto this log that's been damaged by bugs. This is a piece of that work in the exhibition curated by Dallas Fellini, The Body is a Fever Dream. And in that installation, it was actually amazing because two contemporary dancers came in and interacted with my sculptures and the sculptures of another artist. Um, so this is another work from the Sovereign Bodies series to kind of come back full circle. And it's amazing to me the connectivity between the pieces and also between how other people interact with them. Um, so in a review of this exhibition, somebody mentioned that this piece looks like a large closed eye and it had never occurred to me, but I now see that so much. And I think that we can grow so much through that kind of connectivity, which is what I really try to evoke in most facets of my art projects um, is how we're connected and how we're responsible to one another. The piece you're seeing right now is called Seed and kind of ties into that idea conceptually for me. Um, I did a lot of projects last year that were focused on community support and activism. So I created a t-shirt design um, that said disrupt settler colonialism and I sold these t-shirts to help raise funds for Wet'suwet'en um, and other land defenders across Canada. Alongside those t-shirts I created, um, so that's the design, I created a small zine um, on disrupting settler colonialism that was distributed for free with the t-shirts. Can we download it on my website? Anybody can fucking have it. I hope I'm allowed to swear. And um, the idea is to like give easy access to information about what it means to be like on land and interacting with people. And so that kind of community aspect of my art is something that really comes through with the more accessible projects I get to do like t-shirts. I also, um, have a project I call Melancholy Queers Club. People around the world now have this shirt and one of the most amazing things that I hear back about it is that it makes people feel like they're part of a community. Um, the last project that I did in 2020 was actually sending a series of 23 gifts to um, indigenous youth across Turtle Island, specifically queer indigenous youth. And that was, um, you know, something that maybe in some forms, like it's never going to be in a gallery, but it is part of my art practice, I think, because it's just part of who I am and those things aren't separated for me. Uh, and so the kind of multitude of those other items brings me back to this piece, which is one that I staged last year for Pillory. And that was a piece to commemorate um, Indigenous folks who've been killed 
by police actions or had police involved deaths, however you want to say it, in Canada from a point in my own life um, that was very serious and traumatic and where I thought someone I loved might have uh, died in a similar way to the present day. And so this piece was performed in July of 2020. Um, since then, there have been more people who have passed away and it's gonna be an ongoing work until I eventually retire it, which means I have more pieces to bead. Um, and that's something that you know is always weighing on me and always present. But the primary action of that work is the act of care. So the beading, um, and then I actually remove beaded pieces from me that are held on by needles uh, and wipe blood away and then leave. It's not about wounding, it's about healing. And this final piece uh, ties back to the image that I started the presentation with, which is um, called No Vacant Wild and speaks to just the presence of queer bodies and indigenous bodies in the landscape. And because I started out by acknowledging the land I'm on, I thought that would be a great place to finish. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. And um, we'll open it up to the viewers again for questions. So we'll give you a moment there. And Margaret here has a question for you. In your Embodied Bodies work that was uh, exhibited at the Dunlop, I seem to recall that you used wax to cast some of the hands that were on the tree pieces, so tactile. Can you talk a bit more about your use of materials? And also, I wish I had seen more of your beadworks. That's so kind, thank you. Um, I, yeah, I definitely try to be really intentional with the materials that I work with. It's so hard with like 20 seconds a slide to really focus on that. So thank you for asking this. Um, the piece with the wax that you were talking about specifically, I really wanted to emulate that sense of like a wax flow that I felt like I had seen all my life growing up when I was passing through the woods. And um, I really do hope that I can evoke for people kind of a sense of themselves and their human body in the more natural materials that I work with to kind of give a sense of connectivity. And so um, that's definitely something that I find wax really compelling for. I find hair really compelling for that. People have such a visceral reaction to hair. I've had short hair for so long. If it like gets in my fingers when I'm doing the dishes, I'm grossed out. So like, I really want something that like moves you and grabs you to happen with those works and with the material choices. Great, thank you. And we've also got a question here from Vanessa. You speak of connectivity and the importance of touch. Do any of your works mm -hmm. allow the public to touch your pieces and perhaps form that physical connection with them? And do you ever find yourself struggling with the urge to touch other people's art pieces and galleries? I always have to hold my hands back. Um, at first I was thinking that I didn't have a piece that really was something that people could touch, but actually the work that I started and ended the slideshow with, No Vacant Wild, um, involves creating plaster with some sand mixed in, plaster that can break down safely on a beach. Uh, and making um, a whole bunch of replicas of my nipples, which are left on beaches um, for perhaps unwary passerbys, for people who might know that they're supposed to be there as a part of the project, um, to simply break down and dissipate into the environment. And so that's sort of in the way that you're usually not allowed to touch art. It's just like, all right, it's out there. Touch it, do whatever you want with it. Maybe someone's gonna collect it. Maybe it like becomes, I don't know. I don't know, it just becomes sand. Um, but I definitely, um, I'm glad that I have a piece people can touch because when I read your question, I was like, oh, I want that. Never mind, we're good. Um, and I do often want to touch art in art galleries, but I don't, I don't know. I'm pretty good at like withholding from that. So thanks. Great, thank you so much, Sherry. Um, so what we're gonna do for this last little portion here is I'm gonna bring everyone back on. And we're going to kind of open it up um, to whoever has any more questions, but we're going to kind of circle back really quickly as well to Seamus because um, there were some questions here that came a little bit late. Um, all right. So the first one that we have here is from Vanessa. And this was for Seamus. Uh, when exploring themes of identity and self, uh, did you ever find it difficult to open up such personal material to the public? Hello again. Um, not particularly, honestly, uh, as somebody that's like terminally online, I 
have more of a problem with oversharing. So uh, <laughs> making work that's personal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, hasn't been too much of an issue. Uh, but I also find that like um, I don't always have the proper words to articulate, you know, subjects broaching subjects of identity. So I tend to use uh, either metaphors or like sort of combination of text and images to express it, rather than a sort of diaristic uh, approach. Um, so no. And we have another question here um, from Eric. So you've used video game programs to create your recent works. Do you have plans for your works to move back into the digital virtual video game realm? Um, yeah, for sure. I think it depends on uh, what I'm trying to get across and uh, depending on like how immersive I want the environment to be. Uh, also, I, I have sort of like a complicated uh, relationship with VR in terms of its accessibility and sort of relationship with uh, 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 unfortunate corporations. Um, so that's just a hard thing to sort of navigate. Um, but yes, I, I, I do. It just sort of depends on uh, the context of the work. Great. Thank you. All right. So those, those are the only questions we have for the evening. So I'm going to wrap things up really quick here. Um, I've got a couple things to mention, though. Um, it, what the first thing that I'd like to mention is that um, we asked the viewers tonight if you would take a moment to fill out an evaluation form um, for Quick and Dirty Artist Talk tonight. And um, we really value your feedback at Regina Public Library. And this information does help us continue to offer great programs. So I'll be posting that um, in the comments section right now. And as I'm doing that, we've actually got another question here for Elizabeth, if you don't mind um, answering quickly there, Elizabeth. I'll put it up on the screen for us here from Kathy. Uh, Elizabeth, is there anywhere we can see your recent work? I'm primarily on Instagram. I'm not uh, savvy enough to have a website, uh, but I'm primarily on Instagram, uh, which I can put somewhere uh, in the chat or something like that. But yeah. That's so sweet. Also, I'd like to, this is like a total side thing, but uh, Sherry, the Osden in your name threw me off and I worked at the, I was at the gallery when your piece was in the off center uh, oh. show and like people love it. And you are definitely correct that people have such a visceral reaction to hair because some people are like, ugh, gross, or like, or they're like, Oh, I want to touch it or like, you know, it just is incredible how like something simple and then like, it's just hair, but it is like, it's amazing the visceral reaction that people have to hair when it's off the head and how it's like immediately disgusting. So anyways, um, I'm thrilled to have heard from you. I never get to be a fly on the wall for that. So thank you for telling me. Um, I also thank was really, Oh, sorry, Sarah, now go we're ahead, just, go ahead, I was really excited, Seamus, to hear you talking about like video games and how like changing the gender of your character. I just feel like for myself and my younger sibling growing up, like video games were really present and you were talking about that and I was like, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, video games are, I think are like so in influential for so many people, but like the culture around it is uh, generally awful, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Yeah, like turning it into that gender dialogue, I thought it was like it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Um, I wanted to also remind folks of the next Quick and Dirty Artist Talk. Um, that will be uh, focusing on environment, and that will be taking place on Tuesday, June 15th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Central Standard Time on Dunlop Art Gallery's Facebook and YouTube pages, just like this evening. A big thank you to all of the amazing artists who shared their practice and their knowledge with us this evening, and for all of you who tuned in to watch. Have a lovely night, everyone.